If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look in chapter 15 today. This may seem to be like a message I should have held on till Easter. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about that, trying to do that, but, but really felt pressed to go ahead and preach this uh, today. Um, as we think about for a few moments on the truth of the resurrection. The truth of of the resurrection the entire chapter in 15 it deals with the resurrection we're going to look at one verse today we're going to look at verse 12 and when we look at verse 12 we're going to cover much of the chapter in for for the message but as you're turning there uh, Walt Disney he was a remarkable man of vision when he was starting out in Kansas City, he, he couldn't even sell his own cartoons. Uh, some hinted around that he was a man with no talent, but he was a man with a dream. So Walt moved to California. And when he moved to California, he moved there because his brother was doing much better out on the West Coast dealing with tuberculosis. Well, when he moved there, he and his brother together, his brother Roy, founded Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio. They founded this in October of 1923. The company also would operate under the name of Walt Disney Studios and Walt Disney Productions. Before it was, before it was actually changed to Walt Disney Company in 1986. Now, the early days of this company for these brothers was, was tough. Uh, Walt would occasionally present some unbelievable idea to his board of directors, and they would just blink and stare at him. Kind of like some of you are doing right now. They'd just blink and they would stare. They, they were wondering, where was he coming from? And I imagine some of you are wondering, where, where is he coming from today? Well, almost with no exception, when this took place, they would, they would pursue or they would per continue to just want to deny his request. It seemed outlandish to some of the board members. But what I found to be interesting was Walt would not pursue anything that he presented to his board unless the board unanimously resisted his presentation. You, you heard that, right? He would not pursue anything unless he had a unanimous disapproval from his board. He felt like his creative uh, ideas and all the energy that it took for him to come up with, with these ideas, it wasn't worth chasing unless he almost had a fight on his hands. If his message was denied by the board, he moved forward regardless of what anybody else thought, regardless of what anybody would do. He had to prove to them that what he believed in would actually come to fruition. <laughs> it's no wonder that Disneyland and Disney World are now realities. This type of faith is necessary in the business world. But this same type of faith is necessary in the church today. It's necessary for Christians to have a type of faith that when the world says you're wrong, that we're going to stand up and say, no, the Bible, God, his holy word is right. Regardless of what this world says, regardless of who the president is, regardless of who the governor is, regardless of who the mayor is, where we live, regardless of who's standing in the pulpit, we as born again believers must believe the word of God. Amen. And we must exercise our faith in what we believe. You know, that's what Walt Disney did. In what he believed when no one else believed it, he exercised his faith in that. And so should we 
Well, in chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians, we find that the central to the gospel, central to the gospel of Jesus Christ is the doctrine of the resurrection. The resurrection of the body of Jesus Christ. However, for some, it appears some of the believers in Corinth, they just didn't see it this way. It appears that believing in the resurrection was just too much for some. Because... But because there was a reality of unbelief for the resurrection, Paul wants to share with us a remedy to the unbelief of the resurrection. Now, before we can really get into the remedy, we've got to understand what the reality was, what was really going on. And we find this here in chapter 15. The Bible tells us in verse 12, now if Christ is preached... That he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That's God's word. Well, what a profound question that Paul asks. God, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. And we pray, God, that you would move and minister in our hearts and minds today. That we're, whatever is shared today, God, that it would be food for us that we could feast upon. God, we pray that whatever is said this day would glorify you, magnify your son, and edify this body of believers. We pray, God, that you would move upon us and and minister us in such a way to where when we leave here, we have no doubt that the resurrection is real, that it has taken place, and it will take place, that the resurrection of your son took place 2,000 years ago. But God, there's coming a day when the resurrection of the body of believers will take place. God, help us to look forward. Help us to believe. Help us that no matter what the world says, that we will stand upon your truth. And we'll give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. When we look upon the life of Jesus, we find that he had many followers. Many believed what they heard from Jesus. Many believed what they witnessed from Jesus. They believed his words. They believed his work. They believed for they were able to witness his work. And however, many watched him suffer. Many saw him crucified. Many saw him buried. That Friday evening had to be a a time of, of depression for many of the followers of Jesus Christ. That Friday afternoon, many hearts had to have been broken. Many had to have been bewildered. But on Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, John's gospel says before day, Sunday morning, they found the tomb was empty. Jesus had conquered death, hell, and the grave. He had risen from the dead. And the faith of the early Christians was built on the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. However, we find that there were some who died, who did not believe the message of the resurrection. So we find that there is a reality of unbelief of the resurrection. We wouldn't think that professing Christians would have a problem with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that just wasn't the case in Corinth. In the letter that the Apostle Paul received from Corinth about the contentions within the church, we find that this was also a source of contention. There were some within the church that just did not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. There were those who were caught up in theories. They were looking for something to make sense to them. They were, they were looking for something that, that they could reason out. In chapter 15, Paul asked the question here in verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached, how has 
if Christ, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how did some of you say that there was no resurrection of the dead? So that lets us know that this is something that's really going on in the church, that there are those who are saying Christ was not raised. Many of the Greek philosophers were in Corinth at that time, and they considered the body itself as a prison. And death seemed to be a way to deliver someone from the bondage of that body. As a matter of fact, when Paul preached about the resurrection of the dead, some mocked him. Some even thought his preaching was foolish. But that wasn't the only theory out there. There were those who accepted the theory of the swoon theory. Now, what this swoon theory is was that Christ didn't actually die on the cross. Instead, his supposed death was just a temporary blackout or a temporary swoon where he just blacked out and was unconscious for a certain length of time. And he was unconscious during, during the time, those three days or until that third day when all of a sudden the resurrection shared that he gained consciousness. Well, that's another theory that's been out there. But however, there's also the theory of the imposition. The imposition suggested that the Lord's disciples stole the body and then proclaimed to the people that Jesus had, in fact, risen from the dead. Now, apparently, those were just three of the theories that were out there, and apparently some in the Corinthian church wanted to accept maybe one or multiple theories. They were looking for an explanation. They were looking for reason. They were looking to make sense of the resurrection. In other words, they were looking by sight and not by faith. And I think that's been a problem since then. That too many born again Christians or professing Christians, we walk by sight and not by faith. The reason we don't have the blessings that, that, that we should have or that God desires for us to have. Yes, I love the song that we've got a roof over our head. We got shoes on our feet we got food on our table God has truly blessed us but can you imagine the blessings he would have for us if we walk by faith and not by sight there are so many things that we just can't see and we can't explain so we are not sure if we want to accept well if God's word tells us that it's there we should just trust God's word uh, you, they tell me, <laughs> I'm going to leave that right there. We'll talk about that another time. <laughs> you know what's sad is unbelief in the resurrection. It continues today in 2006, as recent as 2006, 15 years ago. Script Howard News Service published that only 36% of American adults believe that after you die, your physical body will someday be resurrected. 54% do not believe so. And 10%, they're just undecided. I'd venture to say that in that 54% are professing born-again Christians. I don't understand that, and I'll tell you why. But I, I wonder, though, I wonder, how do we really realize how much faith it takes to believe? How much faith it takes to believe that God left heaven and was born of a virgin? Do we realize how much faith it takes to believe that he lived a sinless life here on earth in flesh? Do we realize how much faith it takes for us to believe that Though he lived a sinless life, he was cursed, spat upon, beaten, and crucified for it. Do we realize how much faith it takes to believe that, that he gave his body as the ultimate sacrifice for the sin of the world? Do we realize how much faith it takes to believe he was buried in a tomb? And under his own power, he arose from the grave. It takes faith 
to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the gospel. The good news is that God gives us the faith that we need. Aren't you glad he gives us the faith that we need to believe? Romans 12 and 3 says, For I say, though the grace is given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God's given us enough faith to believe. He's given us enough faith to trust him. All we have to do is just trust him with that faith. But the reality is, many will not exercise true faith in Jesus Christ and his resurrection. There are those who will continue to seek for an explanation. There are those who will continue to look for reason. There are those who will continue to try to make sense out of those events. Because to them, the preaching of the resurrection is foolishness. So, with Paul understanding this, he gives us the remedy to the unbelief of the resurrection. Right? We, and the remedy is very simple. We continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's the remedy. We can't get away from that. We continue to share the gospel. You don't have to be in a pulpit dressed up in a coat and tie to preach the gospel. Whenever you're with those who don't believe, just share your testimony and share what Jesus has done for you. That he, he came to this sin-cursed world. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross for the sin of the world to give us forgiveness of our sin. He was buried in a tomb. He arose on the third day. He did this for you. And when he revealed himself to you, you believe. That's the only message we have to share. We continue to preach and teach the gospel. Verse 1 tells us this. It says, moreover, brother, and I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and which you stand. Here what he's telling them is that I've preached to you the gospel, the same gospel, not a different gospel, but the same gospel that you had heard me preach before. The same gospel that they heard when they received Jesus Christ as their Savior, when they were saved, he didn't change his message. He might have changed his methods, but he never changed the message. And my question becomes is, were they actually saved? And Paul even has that same question. He says there in verse 2, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preach to you, unless... You believed in vain. Paul makes it very clear here. If you didn't believe in the resurrection, when I preached the resurrection in the gospel, then you were never saved. You know, that's the problem. We think a lot of people, a lot of people are in a backslidden condition and we're messed up because we, we, we think that, man, you can be saved today and then all of a sudden you're, you can be lost tomorrow. But... That's just not the truth. The fact of the matter is some people may make a profession of faith and they may live for a little while as it seems as if they are truly born again, but they're not. They've never been saved. They never believed. I believe there are backsliders. I really believe there are backsliders. I was a backslider. I lived a backsliding condition for a long time. <laughs> but I know that the resurrection is real. <laughs> I knew it when I was saved. There are those who don't believe that the resurrection is real when they're still leading churches today. They're trying to spiritualize things, but they're as lost as they can be. It's no wonder that, that the world is in the mess that it's in. It's no wonder that the church doesn't shine as bright as God would have it to shine. We got lost people leading churches. Paul Paul says, unless they did not believe the gospel that he had preached to them, if that's the case, they were never believers to begin with. So Paul preached the gospel that Jesus Christ died for their sins according to the scripture. We see this right here in verse 3. In verse 4, he said, according to the scripture, he preached the gospel. Isaiah... Uh, 
Isaiah says that he died for our sins. You know when Paul says he preached that Jesus Christ died for the sin of the world according to the scriptures? If you go back to Isaiah 53 and verse 9 or verse 5, the Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. He died for the sins of the world so that we could have access to God. Paul preached that he was also buried according to the scriptures. In Isaiah 53 and 9, the Bible says they made him a grave with the wicked, but he, but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Paul also here preached that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. In, in Psalm 16 and 10, the Bible says for you, will not leave my soul in Sheol. In other words, he was saying, God will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus, did, he wasn't just buried, but he went to work while he was buried in the tomb. He didn't just lay there, contrary to what some people think, but he was actually at work. Jesus went to the deeper point parts and, and he revealed himself to those who had died in the faith. But he didn't just reveal himself to those who had died in the faith, but he conquered death, hell and the grave. He came back with the keys and because he has the keys, death no more has a sting upon us. The grave no longer has victory over us we can celebrate because of the resurrection we have been we have been set free the remedy to the unbelief of the resurrection is that we must continue to preach the gospel according to the scriptures not according to our thoughts or according to what makes sense to us that's what these Corinthians were doing. They were trying to preach a message that made sense. Uh, preach a message that, that with their high intellect, they could, they could understand and they could reason with. But, but then we can read the Bible and, and if we will come to him with a childlike faith, we'll, he'll reveal that the scripture is real to us. We can trust the scriptures. We preach the gospel according to the scriptures because we can trust the scriptures. Isaiah 40 and 8 says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, the word of God, it stands forever. But the apostle Paul didn't stop there. He didn't just share that we preach the gospel, he also shared the proof of the witnesses to the resurrection. He shared that Jesus was seen by Peter, then the disciples except Thomas, then he was seen by over 500, then he was seen by James, his brother, <laughs> then he was seen by the disciples again with Thomas, and then Paul says he saw him as one born out of due time. What did Paul mean? He said, well, he's like a premature child. What do you mean, preacher? You know, a premature child doesn't get all the nutrients that a, full, that a child that goes the full term gets. But he doesn't change the fact that they're a child. Paul says, I didn't walk with Jesus on earth. I didn't talk with Jesus on earth. But after his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, I met him on the road to Damascus. And because I met him on the road to Damascus, I know that he is real. I know that he resurrected and my redeemer lives he's alive today and just because because he met him he is an apostle of Jesus Christ listen folks I want us to understand there was a day if you're a born again believer that you met him also you might not have seen him eye to eye but through an eye of faith he was revealed to you if he wasn't revealed you've never been saved I'm so glad that God has a way through his scripture through the power of his Holy Spirit to reveal that the resurrection is true that Jesus is alive and he's alive forevermore I'm aware also that no matter how much or how long we preach the gospel according to the scriptures no matter the proof of the witnesses we share some's going to choose not to believe they've got the faith to believe but they're going to choose not to believe 
Anyone who lives contrary to the word of God, it's done by choice. Somebody should have shouted. Didn't you live by choice against the word of God for a while? I want to, in case you don't know it, you did. None of us were born saved. We were all on our way to a demon's hell. And God revealed his son to us and we chose to exercise faith that God had given us and believed. Yeah, I'm aware that many will not choose to believe. But we don't stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Though many deny it. Though the intellectuals and liberal thinkers call us foolish. Though the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is true. It, it is central. It is vital the resurrection, the gospel of the resurrection is vital to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because it's vital, we can't leave it out. Because without the doctrine of the resurrection, there is no doctrine of the gospel. For if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we are no better off than the worst of sinners. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then the Bible is not true and we have no hope. Verse 19 says, if I in this life only we have hope in Jesus Christ, then we are men most miserable. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then there we have no gospel to preach, no savior to preach about. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then he himself is guilty of deception. On five different occasions, Jesus declared that he would get up out of the tomb. If there's no resurrection, Jesus was simply an ordinary man. He was not God. If there is no resurrection, then there's no justification by faith. So we can see just why the devil hates the doctrine of the resurrection, can't we? If he can convince men, women, boys and girls that there was no resurrection then he can convince them that Jesus is still dead. And those he convinces that Jesus is still dead, then they will never believe in salvation. Romans 10 and 9 says that we, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead then we will be saved without belief in the resurrection there is no salvation for none of us that's why I could say what I said earlier any man standing in a pulpit that doesn't believe there was an actual resurrection that has the audacity to tell a congregation that that was a spiritual event there's no bodily resurrection. And what they'll tell, you know what they'll say? <laughs> they'll say, well, you know, people have, have been cremated and those ashes just aren't going to come together. The Bible says that the, that the sea will give up its own. <laughs> if God can bring us out of the mouth of fish in the sea. He can bring us from the fire. And you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter if we are nothing but dust in the ground. Because we're getting a new body. <laughs> One not made by man. But made eternal in the heavens. You know, we worry about things that we can't explain. When all we have to do is just take it by faith. Well. Ooh. I thank God, I thank God that I've heard enough, that I've read enough, and I've witnessed enough to have faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to have enough faith to know that it's a fact. No matter what science says, it's a fact. I have a hope beyond this world. And because Jesus is the first fruit of all who have fallen asleep, meaning Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave, meaning that, that there, there's no grave that can hold this body down, meaning that it doesn't matter when I die, I'm not going to remain in the grave because my God, he resurrected.
resurrected from the grave, then we too can resurrect. He's the first fruit. He's the first fruit. Here's the difference. Some say, well, what about Lazarus? What about the little girl? They had to die again. And they didn't get resurrected until he comes back. And he calls their name. Listen, folks, we, we have to really get this. Because one day, Jesus is going to descend with a shout. And with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds. And I love that. It says we're going to be caught up together. If he comes tomorrow, those who died in the Lord, they're going to rise first. But they're not going to get to him until we all get to him together. Because in the moment, the twinkling of an eye will be changed. Oh, <laughs> What a day that will be. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I want to remind us, those who are saved, it doesn't matter what goes on in this world, we can't lose. <laughs> we can't lose. It doesn't matter how depressed we get, we can't lose. It doesn't matter how hurt we've been, we can't lose. We can't lose as long as we're here on earth with our loved ones. We win. But if we know Jesus is our Lord and Savior and he comes and takes us out of this world, we're in his presence with other loved ones who's gone on before us and we win. Oh, we, this gives me so much comfort in the midst of of this world and all that it throws at us. That no matter what, I've won. Not because of being good enough. Not because of being strong enough. Not because of being faithful enough. But because my Jesus has given us victory. He's given us victory. How? How can we hear the gospel? How can we say that we believe the gospel and deny the resurrection? It was a problem in Corinth. It's a problem in the world. I don't believe it's a problem in this church. But it's a problem in the church universal. There's still those who don't believe in the body being resurrected from the grave. Well, I'm going to keep on preaching. <laughs> I'm going to keep on believing. And when if there's ever a day when I say I have no more faith... <laughs> In this, I hope it's because my faith has become sight and I'm in the presence of God. You know, when we get there, we won't need faith anymore. <laughs> when we get there, our faith becomes sight. But while we're here, I choose to live by faith. I pray that you do too. As every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Unsaved, my question to you is, Today, simply, do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe he was buried in a tomb? Do you believe he rose from the dead and walked out of the tomb? Oh, let me throw this in, unsaved. The tomb was sealed from the outside. If you know anything about canning, what you'll know is that you can't open a sealed can from the inside. You have to open it from the outside. The tomb was sealed from the outside, but Jesus walked out of the inside. He unsealed.
the tomb. He didn't have to. He could have walked through it. But he opened it up so that others would go in and believe. My question is, do you believe? If you do, you can be saved today. If you believe that Jesus died for your sin, he was buried in the tomb, and he arose from the grave, there's nothing keeping you from being saved. There's nothing else you have to believe, and that's the hard part. Trust me when I say this. Receiving him and accepting him as your Lord and Savior is the easy part. For he who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the easy part. So as they begin this song of invitation, my question becomes to you today. Will you believe? Will you choose today to believe and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior?